Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So you guys are all ready for some word? Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, last week, we started on uh, a new old subject. Because <laughs> we have done the definition of God's love. And I just kept getting in my spirit to do it again, especially in this season, in this hour. We are stepping into, we've already stepped into December. We're stepping into the Christmas season, and this is where we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. Doesn't mean he was born at this time, okay? Right. You know, <laughs> this is the time we choose to celebrate because the world is watching, yeah. and then and the world celebrates a secular Christmas, but we have to show them what true Christmas is all about, yeah. and it's the birth of love. Yeah. It's the birth of Jesus, but. Through Jesus was the manifestation of love. Because in John 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And in verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh. Now when you go over to 1 John chapter 4, let's go over there. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. I want you to see this. First John 4, 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, if God is the word and, the, and God is love, the word is love. And so verse 14 was saying that God manifested, he birthed love to the world through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. amen. I should have got a big amen after that. Amen. <laughs> right? God is not, the love of God is not a characteristic of God. It is God. Amen. It Amen. is God. Everything that God has done, he has done because of love. Because he's manifesting love towards you, towards the earth, towards mankind. Amen? Amen. Amen. In Ephesians 5.1 it says, Be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Yes. That's not a suggestion. <laughs> it is a commandment, all right? We are to live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice of God. How Christ lived his life here on earth is how we are to live our life here on earth. He was our example. It sounds a little intimidating, doesn't it? But it's not. It doesn't have to be. Because in, ver in Romans 5.5, 5, it says that hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So the love of God, that love, that love that motivated God to do all that he has done for us is now living on the inside of us. And one of the reasons why we don't yield to that love is because we fail to see the power of love. We see love as weakness instead of strength. But it takes a whole lot of strength to love your enemies. Which God said, love your enemies. Do good to those that hurt you. What? No. -uh. I don't want to do good. I want to kick them in the head. <laughs> you know, well, that's how, that's our flesh. But see, the spirit of God, out of strength, out of power, and that power, that power is plugged into love. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. That power is plugged into love. Is the love that helps you overcome what your enemy is doing for to you and towards you. 
But sometimes we think, well, you know what? I got to take care of this on my own because God's taking too long. No, God takes long. And a lot of times we don't want to trust that God has it mm -hmm. because we don't think he's going to do it how we want him to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. And he's not. Mm -hmm. Because his motivation is what? Love. Mm -hmm. Your motivation might be revenge mm -hmm. and hate. But that's not love. Your motivation might be, well, I got to teach them something. That's not love. It's not your job to teach them something. Your job is not to correct people. I don't care if you see it or not. You're not God's gift to mankind to bring correction. <laughs> well, we got to know our place. I talked about that a little bit on last Sunday. We got to know our place. We got to know the level of authority that God has given to us. And I use that example when Jesus went into the temple. Now, the day before he, you know, pushed all the chairs and, you know, <laughs> he was there the day before walking around observing. He didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. He just watched. And he went home and prayed. And then he came back. And he saw it again. And that's when he went pushed over the tables and, you know, <laughs> you vipers, you made my father's house a den of thieves, all that stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Now notice it was Jesus and not the disciples that did that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people now will be like, well, my pastor does that, so I can do the same thing. No, you cannot. No, you cannot. Because number one, first of all, your pastor, should they be doing that? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> number one. All right, number one. And number two, you're not where your pastor is. You're not where your leader is. You got to know where your authority is. Because you notice Jesus was the only one that ever went into the temple like that. No disciple after that did that. Even though they were called to be in positions of apostleship, they knew their authority. They knew what God wanted them to do. We've got to know that because, see, your authority comes from a place of love. Because God is love. Thank you, Jesus. The entire law can be summed up by love. One of the reasons, again, why we fail to walk in love is because we fail to see the power of love in our life. That's why we don't yield to it. Say that again because we, we need to get this. We need to understand this. Because sometimes we, we think that, well, I... I can have some righteous anger. There is no such thing as righteous anger in the Bible. Show me where that, that, that scripture is. There's no such thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got and, and even when people say the anger of God, the anger of God is not what you think it is. It's not a human anger. You still it's it's like a, a sternness with love. Like like you know it's serious. But it's not anger like he's mad at you. It's a sternness to help you because he knows the direction that you're going in is going to lead you to destruction. And just like any, any, any parent, when their child is running into the street, you, you, you are <laughs> you're like gonna grab them. We just had an incident this morning. Joshua was playing like hide and seek and we couldn't find him. And Carmen came in and she's like, you know what, guys, I cannot find Joshua. When, when that happens, like, your heart drops a little bit. And, and then all of a sudden he kind of came out from back there. I didn't even see him back there. Like he was still and quiet. You know, it, you, what, you couldn't even hear like a little giggle because sometimes you can hear when kids are like, ee, you know, or they're trying, you're trying to find him. Like, he was silent. And it was just like, what, what you know. And, and so I was going to get ready to like run outside. You know, and see like what, what what happened, and he comes out, you know, and he's smiling again. And it's like that's not funny. And stop it. It's like that is not funny. Because what if somebody had come in? We're here. There's nobody in the front. Somebody could have just came in and saw Joshua and said, "Hey, little boy, you want some candy? Come on, come with me." 
and taken him. And, and it was just like, you know, so I had to teach him. It's like, when we call you after two times, you got to come out. You can't hide like that because you just scared your mom. You scared like all of us. So that's not funny. That's not a joke. You want to hide? That's fine. But you, you got to come out. You got to answer us when we're calling you because that's serious. I remember my brother did that when, when he was about uh, four or five. He did it in a mall. He hid. He was in a clothing rack in a store. My mom turned around and he just like ran away and she's trying to find him and, and like panicked. <laughs> you're like, you know, you know, when you find them, you're like, <laughs> you know, but it's, you know, and it's like, don't do that. And see, God loves you so much that he's just like, he will take you and he will shake you. And he's like, don't do that. Cause that's going to hurt you. That's going to hurt my other children. His motivation is love. It's not an anger that we know as anger. Hallelujah. One of the main reasons why God wants us to go over this, this is like a love refresher. I do a lot of faith refreshers, but it was says, we need to do a love refresher. I said, all right, that's good, Lord. Is that... In Luke 14, 21 through 23, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re, um, read it to you. You don't need to go there. He says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest, will reveal and show myself to him. Now, who is God going to manifest himself to? Those that keep his commandments, right? Okay? Those that keep him, them. In the Amplified Classic, it says, I will let myself be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him. See, God will manifest himself through us in how we treat others. Either you're going to manifest the devil or you're going to manifest God. We want to manifest God, don't we? But we have to realize and know that the love of God is already on the inside of us. This is not something that we have to really work up. If you're doing your confessions every day, which is what you should be doing, <laughs> those love confessions every day you're stirring up that love and it's just going to come out even when you feel like you're going to be impatient all of a sudden the love of God starts kicking in and you go you know what I can be a little bit more patient with this person with this situation and so we have to move past thinking that loving God means saying I love you to him that's not loving God. Yes. That's praising God. <coughs> we confuse praising with loving and loving with praising. But we have to keep them in the same order, in the same lane. Love is action. Love is action. It's not an emotion. And this is what also confuses people. Now I, I get it. I know God wants to meet us where we where we're at. And I and I understand a lot of people, they want to feel the presence of God. I get that. I understand that. And 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 God will meet you right where you're at. But we can't be completely dependent on our feelings. Because there are times where we just have to stick take a step of faith and just know that God is there. And that God He will reveal Himself. He will show Himself to you. But, what are, but how he does that is through us and how we treat others. That's how he manifests his love towards others is through us. This is why the world says that we're hypocrites because we're not manifesting love towards others. But also because it's like we, we've compromised too much. We've compromised too much and God doesn't want us to compromise Yes, there's some hard truths in this Bible. There's hard truths in this Bible. But is 
God has spoken those truths to us from a foundation of love because he loves us. We might not comprehend and understand why he says that. We might not understand why is homosexuality a sin. We might not understand that, but God lists it as sin. It is in the Bible. But that doesn't mean that you go around hating people that say that they're homosexuals and treating them bad. That doesn't mean that. Because you know what? You could be having some other sin in your life. And it isn't until we get the revelation that that sin, we have to get that before we can change. And the way we get that is by spending time with God. Because see, if you've broken the point, at, if you've broken the law at one point, you've broken all of it. There is no degree of sin. I like how people say, well, you know, that's you know, a little, a little white lie. No, a lie is a lie. It doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if it's black, white, purple, blue, green, whatever. A lie is a lie. And all liars are going where? To the lake of fire. It says all liars. It, does, it doesn't say, well, all unbelieving liars. It says all liars are going to the lake of fire in Revelations. So this is why God says we've got to clean it up. And see, one of the reasons why we lie is because you don't trust God to take care of you. It's a survival mechanism. Well, i got to lie so that people don't reject me, so I don't get in trouble, because we don't trust but also because we haven't renewed our mind to the truth. And the truth is what? The gospel. God's word. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Last week, we started talking about 1 Corinthians 13.1, and that gives us the true definition of love. So let's go over to 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13, and we started at verse 1. The last time I did this series, I, I titled it Love the Most Excellent Way. Because if you go back to verse 13 and verse 31, not 13, I'm sorry. First Corinthians 12, verse 31. The 12th chapter of First Corinthians talks about the gifts of the Spirit, right? And we are to desire the gifts of the Spirit. We're to desire to prophesy and all of this stuff. But in verse 31, it puts it in perspective. Because it says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Sometimes we focus so much on the prophecy and the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom and healing and you know, all, all of the, those, the different gifts of the Spirit, you know, the interpretation of tongue, discerning of spirits, all of this stuff. And we think, yeah, I'm really good at that. I can, I can discern. I'm really good at discerning. And, but we don't have love. Because operating in these gifts means that you're operating in love. Because all of these gifts are a manifestation of God's love towards an unbeliever, or unbeliever because you can speak to both people that's how God wins people that's how God wins people because he, he, he reveals secrets about people and they'll be like how do you know that well God told me what what do you mean God told you that well I made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior and there's these gifts and God knows all of this information about you, and so he's, he's revealing himself to you. Wow, what? how do I know this Jesus? I want to know this Jesus. I want to do the same thing that you're doing. <laughs> right? It's all to... Because if you see in the Old Testament, they operated in the gifts of the Spirit as well. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They weren't born again. Like, Ooh, what? <laughs> That's for a different teaching. Amen. All right, verse 1 says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. Now, charity in the Greek means agape. That's love, right? 
I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Symbol. We already defined sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. When we went back and we looked at, if you go back and look at pagan worship and rituals, in the temples, they would bang on metal to get the people to a state of ecstasy. And it would go on all day long. All day long. You could not escape from it. It's just like ding, 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 ding. The hollow sound just really annoying. It wasn't pretty. It was just uh, annoying. And you couldn't escape it. So later on, this phrase, oh, they're just like sounding brass. Oh, they're just like a tinkling cymbal. And what it referred to was people who talked a lot and say and weren't saying anything. We, know, we all know people. You might be a person <laughs> that talked, that just talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and didn't really know anything. You're not saying anything. Because you don't know anything, but you feel like you have to say thing, something so that you can be important. Right? Okay. So let's keep going. Let's keep reading verses 2 and 3. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profit me nothing. Now look at that. We see gifts of prophecy, understanding all mysteries, having all knowledge, having all faith to remove mountains. But if your motivation isn't love, it means nothing. It means nothing. Because it says, I am nothing. Verse 3, and though I bestow all goods to feed the poor. Isn't that a good thing? Mm -hmm. Right? You think, well, what? but people can do that not out of a motivation of love, but out of motivation to get rid of guilt. Hmm? There are a lot of rich people that just give because they feel guilty that they have money. You don't have to feel guilty that you have money. There are people that are not rich that give because they feel guilty. But that shouldn't be the motivation. The motivation needs to be what? Love. Love. Mm -hmm. And though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profit me nothing. See, in order to serve people as God wants you to truly serve them, we need to know what God's love is. Because if we're not walking in the God kind of love, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. And you might have your definition of love, but your definition of love means nothing because it's not God's love. This is why we have to have a refresher and go, okay, <laughs> I thought I was walking in love, but <laughs> we can always go a little deeper, can't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we haven't arrived. You're not going to arrive until you go home to be with Jesus. Let me just tell you that right now. <laughs> There's always a deeper level. I'm serious. You can look at all the big names, yes, all the signs, wonders, and miracles, and all of that. But you know what? They still have problems and issues. They still have things that God's correcting them on and all of this stuff. So another level, another devil. <laughs> but God's love will never leave you. And we can always go deeper. All right? So it's not about being the best pastor, the best prophet, the best preacher. It's not about operating in the gifts of the spirit and prophesying. Everybody wants to be a prophet, so they can prophesy all this, duh, you know? But just like we learned, God wants friends. And to be a friend of God means that he can trust you with secrets. And when God can trust you with secrets, it's because you love because it's you, you love God. You're not you don't want, you're not after fame. You're not trying to get famous. Well, I'll just put this on Facebook because God showed me. 
you know, the, the destruction is going to come. If destruction comes, it's because we failed. The church has failed to do their job. We have not stepped into the place of the true ecclesia to, to pronounce mercy upon our country and our nation and on the world. Mm-hmm. Jesus is coming back Amen. for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He is coming back. And yes, there are going to be things that are going to happen because they have to fulfill what is in this word. Yes. But it doesn't have to touch the church. Yes. Mm. But we've got to clean up. And how we clean up is what? Manifesting more love in our life. Not just to ourselves, but to others. Hallelujah. We need to constantly be putting ourselves in remembrance of what the love of God is. That definition of agape love. Because there's power in that love there's power to change your family there's power to change cities there's power to change states and your country there's power in that love all right so the title of this series is love what is it good for the definition of love (laughs) well y'all know that that tina turner song what love got to do with it? Got to do with it. <laughs> Everything. Everything. If we are proclaiming that we are Christians, that we are children of the Most High God, and we're not manifesting love, what does that say to the world? That's right. You're not Christians. <laughs> you are not a Christian. And you can speak hard truths even in love. See, when we fail to do that, we don't love. We don't love. Let's go over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and I'm going to look at verse 25. Well, let's start at verse 22. That gives us a little bit more context. Instead of me just telling you, we'll just read it through. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Right? So we're supposed to be doers of the word. Manifesting the love of God is being a doer of the word. Okay? For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, which is a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. What is the perfect law of liberty? It's God's word, which is love. Okay? And continueth, now that word continueth, because it ends with an E-T-H, it should, it, it means in the modern vernacular, continuing. It doesn't stop. You, you got to keep looking into this perfect law of liberty. Keep reading it. Keep putting it before your eyes. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Right? So the verses in 1 Corinthians are powerful verses because they are, they serve as a mirror to us. This is what we are supposed to look like. So when you look at 1 Corinthians 13, go back over to 1 Corinthians 13. This, this whole chapter 13, actually the whole entire Bible, right, but we're just focusing on 13 right now, okay, serves as a mirror. This is what you really look like. 
You've got to compare yourself with the word, what you're doing, what you are saying. Because if we look into this mirror honestly, we are going to find 15 points that describe the love of God and how that love is supposed to manifest in our life. 15 points. We're, we're lucky if we're hidden too. <laughs> but 15 points, okay? There's 15 characteristics of the love of God. This is why we have to keep looking at it over and over again. Because like I said, on a good day, we may hit three. May. <laughs> right? But we're supposed to be operating in all 15 of them. And we can get there. It's not impossible. I know a lot of people read this and go, that is impossible. I ain't doing that. No, you can do that. Because you're not by yourself. You're not alone. Because this is the love of God that has been shed abroad in your heart. This is what's manifesting towards others. See, when you truly yield to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is love, you will, if, when you yield to love, you're going to do love. <coughs> Let me say that again. When you yield to love, you're going to do love. When you yield to love, you're going to do love. Say that with me. When I yield to love, I'm going to do love. I'm going to do love. Amen. Right. Now, you know, we already went back to 1 Corinthians 13, but in verse, in James 1, 25, that last part, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds in his actions right so to know that we are walking in love means that we are demonstrating these love characteristics towards others and even towards ourselves mm -hmm. because that's really important a lot of times we're so hard on ourselves we need to manifest love towards ourselves yeah. mm -hmm. when you start to do that you're going to be blessed in your deeds a lot of times we find out well lord where are the blessings where are the blessings why aren't there more well where's your love Where's your love? Yeah, yeah, God will meet you where you're at. But you know what? We got to grow up too, don't we? Yeah. Yes. And as we grow up and mature, we're growing up and maturing in love. Yeah. We're displaying more and more characteristics of love. We're manifesting more love. That's how you know you're getting more mature. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we just had George H.W. Bush's funeral. Right? And all the presidents came for it. And media always has to like overanalyze everything. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like, oh, God, it's like really? You know? Good. It's like this isn't about anybody but George H.W. Bush. Yeah. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, you know, President Trump was shaking hands with the different presidents. And one newscaster said, well, I wouldn't shake his hand. Ooh. Because you're immature. Yeah, absolutely. That's why. You're immature, so you wouldn't you wouldn't hate, hate, um, shake anybody's hand. Sometimes, even when somebody has spoken bad about you, and it's been both ways. Come on now, <laughs> not, you know, nobody's innocent. <laughs> you know, sometimes you gotta go and shake hands because, especially now in this day and age where there's social media, everybody feels emboldened to be a little bit meaner because they don't have to look at somebody in the face and say that to their face. Mm -hmm. They could just say it on social media. See, this is where we gotta kinda step up. Be like, you know, stop. Mm -hmm. Just because you think something doesn't mean you have to type it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Facebook's not your open diary. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes on the post, I'm like, oh my God, really? Oh my goodness. So we have to be open to the reflection that we're seeing here. Because if this, if our reflection isn't lining up with what has been written, who needs to change? Me. Me. We do. Right. We do. Right. Not, we don't need to water down the word, because right. a lot of people will water down the word. Right. No, we, we have to change. And we change with the help of the Holy Spirit. 
You don't have to do it by yourself. You're not called to do it by yourself. That's why God said that, you know, well, God, Jesus said, well, I have to go so that the Holy Spirit can come and be with each and every one of you. It's better that I go. Because, see, there was only one Jesus. But how many Holy Spirits are there? <laughs> millions, because there's millions of Christians, because he can live in each and every one of us. So that's better. Don't you think that's better? Yeah. Definitely better. Right? Okay. So we're going to continue, and we're going to, in this, in this teaching, we're going to look through those 15 characteristics of love that are listed in verses 4 through 8. Right? We're going to define three of them today. But the first thing that we need to do is define the word love, agape. Mm -hmm. The word, the agape word for love in the Greek is agape, okay? Agape means a divine love that gives and gives and gives even if it's never responded to or acknowledged. This is the highest form of love that we can operate in because this is the love of God. He has given and given and given, even though some people have never responded to it or acknowledged it. Because he gave his son Jesus, right? And if we've all received God's love through receiving his son, Jesus, that would mean that we responded to it, right? But not everybody has responded to the call, have they? Yeah. They've not, not everybody has responded to salvation, okay? And so this is why it is the highest form of love, because it isn't based on a response, we say that again. The love of God is not based on response, but it's based on the decision to keep loving regardless of a recipient's response or lack of a response. The word agape is only used in the New Testament to describe God's love and the love that should be flowing from the hearts of every believer. Again, Romans 5.5 5 says, That hope maketh not ashamed, because the love, that's the agape of God, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. That word shed abroad in the Greek means a pouring forth, a discharge, a spilling out, or something that's been dispersed in abundance. This God didn't just give you like a little drop. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't just give you, oh, here, 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 this is enough love. No, he, it, like a waterfall. Mm -hmm. Okay? In abundance. Right. To the overflow, he has shed his love in your heart. Mm -hmm. Just like a, a huge waterfall. That's how you have to think about it. Because sometimes we might think we have like, a little faucet, <laughs> you know, it's kind of plugged up and it's just like, you know, that's how it feels sometimes. But God did not just eke out some love. He poured out love into you. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay. Our natural love has an end point. But the love of God is limitless. So just when our love is running out, yeah. that's when the agape love of God starts. We all know it because there's unconditional love and conditional love. Conditional love is, well, I'll do for you if you do for me. That's conditional. But agape is unconditional. It's not based on what anybody has done for you. You're just manifesting love towards this person, and you're not asking or thinking that they should do anything in return. This love can be manifested, I believe, easier to strangers than it can to your family members that you see each and every day. Because with a stranger, you don't see them. There's no expectation. You just like, you freely can give. 
and you feel really good, don't you? Like, wow, yeah. But when you go home, you're like, this joker. <laughs> I've been cooking him dinner for the whole week and didn't get one thank you. you know, I mean, you know, it's like, that's not the agape of God. Okay? You're ex why are you cooking dinner? To get that thank you? Are you doing it as a manifestation of love because you want to provide for your family because God has provided for your whole family so you want to be a conduit of the manifestation of agape and give to your family, right? But sometimes it's really hard because you think, look, I have sacrificed. I have slaved over this stove all day. I could at least get a little bit of thank you. <laughs> But that's not agape. Agape does what? It gives and gives and gives, even if it's what? Never responded to or even acknowledged. Oh, it kills your flesh, doesn't it? Just hearing the definition is like, oh, God. Lord, you do need to help me. <laughs> That's why it's agape. It's the highest form of love because it's God. And you can do it because God said you could because he gave it to you. He does not lie. No. God is not a man that he should lie. A lot of it is we just need to kill our flesh. Just kill that flesh. And how you kill the flesh is yielding more and more to the Holy Spirit. Because when you want to say, did you like the meal? Yes, it was really great. And you want to go, and? <laughs> you know, trying to wait for that, trying to hint at the, the thank you, you know? <laughs> and you don't get it. It's like, now I'm not saying you don't teach your children manners, okay? You know, but what's the motivation behind it? Okay. All right. Let's begin with the first three characteristics of agape. First Corinthians 13, verse 4. I'm reading out of the King James Version. So every word that's it, that is love is going to be charity. Okay. Charity is agape. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. We're going to look at suffereth long, we're going to look at kind, and we're going to look at envying. So let's first look at suffering long. Agape suffereth long. That word suffereth long in the Greek pictures the patient restraint of anger and therefore long suffering. It can be translated as forbearance, politely or patiently restrain an impulse to do something or refrain. It can also mean patience. Now, I'm going to repeat that. Let me repeat that again before I move on. Suffering long means it pictures the patient restraint of anger and therefore long suffering. It can be translated as forbearance. And forbearance can be politely or patiently restrain an impulse to do something. It means to refrain, to be patient, okay? Now, patience is not the same as waiting. We've watered down this word because we think, well, just be patient because we're like in a hurry. And we think that being patient means to, to wait, but it doesn't. It means possessing quiet, uncomplaining endurance under distress. Patience means possessing quiet, uncomplaining endurance under distress. And endurance is the capacity to bear pain, distress, or prolonged hardship. 
okay? So patience is possessing quiet, uncomplaining endurance under distress. So when you're in the long line at Walmart and you're like, this is absolutely ridiculous, I can't believe I'm in this long. That's not mm -hmm. patient. Mm -hmm. That's not patient, mm -hmm. right? It's not just waiting, right? The word long suffering is like a candle with a really long wick. When you light it, it is prepared to burn for a very long time, a very long time. It's ready to forbear. It's, it's patiently waiting until a certain person comes around. Mm -hmm. It's patiently waiting for that person to change, to make progress, or mm -hmm. it, it's patiently waiting to, to hear <laughs> what that that person is trying to do something that has been taught, okay? And so this pictures a person whose feelings for someone else are so passionate, okay, that they don't easily give up. You guys all have seen the, you know, the romantic movies where the man sees the woman. He's like, <gasps> she's the one. And then he does everything and anything to win her heart. It's so passionate. And she might say, no, I don't like you. And then he goes, no, she is the love of my life. Hallelujah. I have got to have her. I'm going to have her. It's going to be all right. I will win her heart. He's so passionate about her that he doesn't give up. It's the same, we have to have that same passion for everybody, that we don't give up on them. When we wanna just say, forget it. Now that doesn't mean that there's gonna be times where you, 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 you don't separate. Because sometimes we do need to separate from people. But you don't ever stop praying for them. You don't ever stop confessing over them. And when, and when they are around, it's long suffering. It's, it's being patient until they come around and it's showing and manifesting love, right? And kindness. We're going to get to kindness and what that means, right? <laughs> okay. So this person is so passionate that they don't easily give up. Instead, they keep going and going and going, even if that person doesn't quickly respond to them because they know the power of love. They know that love will overcome everything. Even the world knows that, right? In the movies, love will overcome everything. It's just that they have a messed up definition of love. <laughs> but really, it's agape that is unending. It never gives up. Never, ever gives up. See, God never gave up on you. Even when you rejected him. Even when you said no to him, even when you rejected him, he never gave up on you. His love never changed. He was long-suffering with you. This is the total opposite of human nature, which is impatient, short-tempered, and intolerant. And we're seeing that even more and more, just the intolerance of, of just difference. It's almost comical. <laughs> we're, we're the tolerant group, but we don't like you. <laughs> no, you're not tolerant. <laughs> right? One of the hardest things to do is to be patient with someone that you really care about and you really love. And you know that they can do better, and they're not. It really is hard, and this is why we need agape. Because it's agape that will... When your love has ended, when your patience has ended, this is when long suffering starts kicking in. And then it's like, Lord, please give me long suffering. I'm going to stir this up within this person because I know what you have said about this person. I know. And see, it's just staying focused on what God has said over them. Agape is slow to anger slow to wrath, and doesn't know how to quit. It doesn't even know how to quit. So quitting is not an option. It's not even a thought. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. Because quitting always comes to us. It's so easy to quit. 
But you don't want to get used to a pattern of quitting, especially on people. Agape doesn't know how to quit because it doesn't know what quitting is. This love is what's going to transform people. All right, so let's put this back in the scripture. With that definition, it says agape, just love. So love patiently and passionately bears with others for as long as patience is needed. It's kind of like a quick summary of that. I'm going to say that again. Love patiently and passionately bears with others for as long as patience is needed. And you don't know how long patience is needed until God tells you. So you don't quit. You don't quit. Because if God doesn't tell you to quit, you don't quit. All right, this leads us then to the next characteristic of love. And that's love is kind. Does everybody know how to be kind? I don't have any hands raised, so. <laughs> okay, well, this is good. You're in the right place this morning. Everybody, everybody's looking around like, I don't know you want kindness. <laughs> All right, kind. kind is not just being nice. I think we've kind of confused that with, oh, just be kind to one another. No, actually, you're saying be nice. Mm -hmm. Be nice to one another. Kind, in this scripture, in the Greek, means to be adaptable. Mm -hmm. Be adaptable or compliant to the needs of others. To show oneself useful. So kind, in the Greek, means to be adaptable to be compliant to the needs of others, to show oneself useful. When the agape of God is operating in your life, you don't demand that everyone be like you or do things like you. Well, I wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I wouldn't do my way. <laughs> you know? So sometimes God just says, just let them do it their way. But God, they're not doing it how like I want to do it. It's like, it's all right, it'll still get done, but they're not doing it how I, <laughs> it's like, it's okay. I don't want the dishes. Your kids never put the dishes away how you want them to put the dishes away. But are they put away? Yes, they are. My mom has this little thing with my dad. My dad puts the dishes away. He never puts it away how my mom puts it away. But she never changes it. Because she's like, I don't care. They're put away. Because <laughs> sometimes some people go, well, you can put the dishes away. Okay, and they put the dishes away. And then you come out after and you change it. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. Did God tell you to do that? That's not being kind. That's not being adaptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> I know, amen or oh. <laughs> you know. See, instead, kind, being kind, right? Agape kind means that you're going to bend over backwards to become what others need you to be in order to help them. Right? Kindness portrays a willingness to serve in order to meet the needs of others. And you're, be and you're willing to become what people need you to be. So if somebody needs a friend, you're a friend. If somebody needs a maid, you're a maid. Right? If somebody needs a cook, you can become a cook. If somebody needs a, a parent, a mom or a dad, you can become that for them. In order, you become what they need so that they can change to be what God's called them to be. And God will use your anointing. This doesn't mean changing your personality. And I think that's what a lot of people think. They fear that, oh, I'm going to have to change my personality. No, it's not changing your personality. It's adapting to the needs of others and what they need for you to be. Sometimes some people just need for you to listen. So that means you're gonna have to adapt yourself and not give all of the wonderful, beautiful advice that you would normally give. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> mm -hmm. You just have to like zip it up. There's a lot of things that I see 
that I, I would like to change right away. But the Lord says, it's not time yet. Just, just long suffering, Melissa. <laughs> because see, in our long suffering, then manifests kindness. Because sometimes I just need to be, just be quiet. You need to correct everything all over the place. If I corrected everybody and everything that I saw, y'all be out. <laughs> like, that pastor's got a problem and an issue. I am out. He's out. Thank you. you know, you got to wait for the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit wants to work on people, and then they get the revelation. So you speaking and saying all that you want, you think that you're being really great and giving them wonderful full advice. It's in one ear and out the other. Mm -hmm. They're just smiling. Go, oh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Mm. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And see, this is the complete opposite of self-centeredness and selfishness. Real agape kind puts people first. It doesn't think of itself first. It puts others first. Now, this doesn't mean that you neglect yourself. There's balance. I can already hear, whoa, I gotta put everybody first all the time. No, there's balance and there's boundaries. You gotta know the difference when God wants you to, you know, which characteristics he wants you to manifest and when. Okay, there's balance in all of this. Because I know some people, you know, they've done things and I'm like, I had no peace with them doing it. And they think, well, I have to do this because I have to, you know, be kind and I have to, you know, and it's just like, well, no. Sometimes you're enabling people. And God doesn't want you to enable. So we have to use the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Right? Let's go over to Luke 10. Let's look at a, an example. Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, and we're going to read the story of the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Luke 10, 30. Okay. Luke 10, and we're going to read through 35, okay? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among theme, thieves, which stripped him of raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came, looked on him, and passed on by the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And when and on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now look, the Samaritan, none of the other two, they just stopped by, they go, mm, no, not my problem. <clears throat> but the Samaritan, he stopped. How did he show kindness? He adapted and he became exactly what this man needed. This man needed a doctor, he became a doctor. This man needed transportation to a place, he transported him to an inn. This man needed money because he had no money because he was robbed, so he became a bank. See, this is the kindness of God, adapting so that you can help somebody out of their situation. He became all of those different things towards him. This is manifesting the agape kindness of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? Do you see that? Do you see how clear that is? How he adapted himself? He was on a journey. He was working. He had to go on a job. But he stopped. He didn't think about himself. The other two probably thought about themselves. Well, you know what? I, gotta, I have an appointment. I've got to get to. I don't have time for that. Now, I remember coming to church, and I was like, mm -hmm. I had like five or ten minutes. <laughs> you know, so I was running a little late before intercessory prayer, and I saw this woman had um, slipped on the road, and she was in, a, in the ditch. She had an SUV, so she was like on, on the side of, 
as you're turning into Bennington. And, and I, I didn't notice her until it was too late that I passed by and I was like, oh man, I was like, I need to stop. Um, so I like got off the exit and I went around again because I was like, I need to make sure that this lady is okay. I don't want to just assume that she has a phone, that, that she's okay, she's in an SUV, that that's okay, she can get out. I just wanted to. So even though I was, gonna, I was running late for intercessory prayer, I, just, I had a phone. So I just said, I'm running late. I got to check something out first. So I just went around. By the time I got around again, she had gotten out. And I was like, okay, thank God. But my concern wasn't about me and running late because we had to do intercessory prayer at 9 o'clock. <laughs> it was, you know, is, is she okay? Because I could tell it was a woman. And, you know, even in, I don't know, you have to be careful, even in an SUV. doesn't mean that you can just, you know, fly around, you know, those things. Every time there's a snowstorm, I always see SUVs in the ditch because they think they could just, like, hey, I've got four-wheel drive. That doesn't mean you are invincible. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But see, kindness, the kindness of God adapts itself so that you can help others. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. So let's put this back into the definition. So when we put this into the scripture, love doesn't demand others to be like itself. Rather, it is focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to become what others need it to be. Right? Okay, now this leads us to the next characteristic, which is agape envieth not. Agape envieth not. So envy means to covet. To covet means to desire wrongfully. or without due regard for the rights of others. So envy in the Greek means to covet, and covet means to desire wrongfully, or without due regard for the rights of others. This describes a person who is radically consumed with his own desires, wants what other people have, okay? And he plans and, and plans that he's willing to sacrifice anything and anyone to get it. So even if that means sacrificing relationships, they will sacrifice relationships. So if a person gets what they want, well, they're not gonna talk to that person because you got what I wanted. That's envy. You're wanting something that's wrongfully um, not yours. Now you may want the same thing, but that doesn't mean that God can't provide two things for two people. Mm -hmm. It just might not be your time. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You can also describe this person as being overly ambitious to the point of being self-centered. Because it's all about them. They're just like, I got to have it, I got to have it, I got to have it, I got to have it. Right? He's so consumed with himself that he doesn't ever think about the needs or desires of others. And this is kind of like with kids. A lot of kids are just selfish. What about me? What about what I want? I want this. I want that. So they don't really think about other people, <laughs> their parents or their friends or anything like that. So you kind of have to, like, teach them. You got to think about other people. You know, when somebody gives you a gift, you have to say thank you, show a little kindness, and be, you know, very thankful. Don't just be like, eh, I don't want that. Or, eh, that's, you know, that's rude. <laughs> so you don't want to ever do that. <laughs> you got to teach your kids how not to be that, okay? <laughs> because then you lead them to, to, to envy and wanting what other people have. Oh, well, I don't want this. I want that. Well, that's, you didn't get that. So this is what you got today. Maybe tomorrow you'll get something like that, or maybe later on, right? Real agape love doesn't think of itself first, but it's always looking outward. It's always thinking of other people rather than itself. And like I said, there's a balance to this, but you really isn't an inward focus. A lot of times if, we're, if we are too inward focused on ourselves, 
it leads to bad things, really bad things. So you want to be more outward focused, more of like, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do these things? Who do you want me to bless today? And being a blessing can mean different things. It doesn't always mean material things. You know, Kelly was talking about being a giver. Well, giving your time, giving your words, giving wisdom, those are all things that you can give that have no monetary value but are very valuable. Amen. Okay? All right. And see, let me give you like this example. See, it's because we're talking about envy. And it's, you know, you're, you're, you're not thinking it's to desire wrongfully or without due regard to the rights of others and what they have. And just think of it as the father who comes in after a long day, a long day of work is happy to see the kids, but instead of eating and going straight to bed, he comes out and he talks to his kids. He reads to them. It's not always about me and about, well, I'm just really tired. I had a long day at work. Don't talk to me. I'm tired. I don't know. You know, Mr. Johnson over there, he's got a great job, and he knows how to, you know, he's a great father. I see him all out there with his kids all the time. Well, that's because he's got a better job than I got. Maybe if I had a better job, then I could be a better dad. No. No, sir. You can be a better dad right where you're at. You can be a better mom right where you're at. This is why you can't covet what other people have. Because you didn't make the decisions that that person made. You didn't go to the school that they went to. You didn't have the family that they went to. And you can whine and cry and say, well, yeah, that's right. I didn't have, you know, what they had. Well, you know what? You can only claim that until you're about 18 when you're out of high school, and then your decisions are your decisions. So what are you gonna do after that? Are you gonna go to, to, to college? If not, then that's your decision. Where are you gonna go, and what are you gonna do? But coveting what other people have isn't love. Because envy is a killer. Cain and Abel helped us out with that. <laughs> right? That was almost like that was the first drama that happened <laughs> other than Adam and Eve, you know, eating the apple, disobeying God, getting kicked out, and then it was like, okay, they got kicked out, and then all of a sudden things are going pretty well, okay, we've established a life out here, and, and then, you know, Cain gets jealous of Abel's sacrifice, and he kills his brother out of envy because he coveted wrongfully his sacrifice, his brother's sacrifice. He knew how to do sacrifices. He just did it wrong. He was taught how to do it. He just thought, well, this is good enough. I'll just bring some, you know, some of my uh, crops. Uh-uh. That's not the sacrifice that he was supposed to bring. This is why God was like, uh, no, sir. <laughs> but he thought he was... He, Cain thought God was favoring Abel, and he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And see, we allow, if we yield to envy, we think that God favors other people, and he doesn't. Mm -hmm. God doesn't have favorites. Mm -hmm. Everyone is his favorite. But then why aren't I getting blessed? How are other people getting blessed? Well, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And what are you not doing? Amen. That's it. There isn't anybody else to blame but you. This is why we got to look at this mirror. Look at this mirror. Are we doing what God is telling us to do? So we put this back into the scripture. It says that love is not overly ambitious, self-centered, or so consumed with itself that it never thinks of the needs or desires that others possess. really quiet in here that's a good thing <laughs> that's a good thing because you know what that means that I hope that you're ho holding up that mirror to yourself and going Lord can I go a little deeper with this can I be a little bit more long suffering with those around me can I show a little bit more kindness towards somebody can I be less envious 
of those around me. Now, it's okay to, you know, want what somebody has, but not to the point where you are, uh, where you think that it was bad that they had it. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That's where it starts right. to become covetous. Because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, why do they got that? And I didn't get that. I work really hard. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe I might have to look at your definition because just because you work a lot of hours doesn't mean you work hard. <laughs> Uh, truth. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. <laughs> well, sometimes we have to kind of like jerk because a lot of people think, well, I work all these hours. Yeah, but what are you doing all in between there? Some people work slow on purpose just to be slow. Huh? Like, they're not getting anything, any, anything else more done. <clears throat> than what you could get done in an eight hour day. So, one question that I want you to ask yourself. Am I being committed to seeing others blessed and successful? Or am I more committed to my own cause, my own success, than anybody else? You see, we compare ourselves then we will allow the success of others to cause us to feel like we are insignificant. And when you feel insignificant and insecure, then you're not gonna be long suffering, you're not gonna be kind, and you're gonna envy, mm -hmm. instead of not being envious. But when you're focused, and that's because you're not focused on what God wants you to do. There's a difference between between being inward focus all about you and being focused on what God wants you to do. When God wants you when you're focused on what God wants you to do, it's not all about you, even though the sacrifice of Jesus is about you, but it isn't all about you and what God just wants to do for you, but it's what God wants to do through you for others. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay? Because I don't want this to get out of balance thinking that, well, I have to do everything for other people and I don't take care of myself. No, you, you have to take care of yourself. Like I said in the beginning, there's a balance to this. And a lot of times we need to manifest this love towards ourselves. We need to be more patient with ourselves, more long-suffering with ourselves when we're learning new things. You know, we need to show ourselves more kindness and, and, and be a little bit more adaptable so that we can learn new things. And we don't have to be envious of others that you think that they pick things up quickly. Well, I wish I was like so-and-so because, you know, they just seem to pick things up really quick. Well, in that area, but you don't know what other areas that they might be struggling in. They may not be getting it. A lot of times, there's stuff that I struggle. I'm like, Holy Spirit, you gotta show, you gotta show me how to do this. Like, I got no clue. You know, we did put up the projector and everything, and I came on Saturday. I finished it up. Everything was working perfectly. Sunday, we came in, and the sound is not working. And I'm like, it worked yesterday. I don't know what the problem is. And I'm like, I'm on there, I'm like. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the problem is. We're checking everything. It's all the plugs, because you know you have to check, make sure everything's all plugged in and the power works. And I, okay, everything worked. And I'm just like, okay, what's going on here? And I'm just clicking on stuff and I'm like, Holy Spirit, show the way. Cause we need some sound. <laughs> well, something happened and the speakers were trying to go through the projector and not the computer. And once I found, figured that out, and honestly, I don't know if I could replicate it. <laughs> I probably could, uh, but I was like, okay, just went to the sound, the speakers, figured it out. It was like, we've got sound. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. But I needed some long suffering <laughs> in there because I was like, it worked yesterday. <laughs> I don't know why it's not working today. I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> So sometimes you gotta manifest the love of God towards yourself mm -hmm. so that you can manifest it towards others. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so 
So we need to really put our trust in the Lord and start operating in this agape. Because it's through agape where you will find the power to not only change your life, but also to change the lives of others. You know, a lot of people, they just need a word of encouragement. They just need to know that you, you can do this. You, you can get it. It's okay. It's all right. You stumbled. It's all right. God still loves you. Here, let's pray. I'm for you. I'm not against you, and I know that you can do this. Because if God can change me, he can change you, girlfriend. <laughs> Whatever. True. Mm -hmm. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We want to start sowing love. And not just any kind of love, but agape. Because mm -hmm. as you begin to sow agape love, you're going to reap agape love back. When you manifest, when you show, when you reveal the love of God towards others, you are going to start to reap that back into you. And that's what we all need. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, so let's put all of those definitions that we just went through, let's put it all back into this, that first verse. And it says, Love patiently and passionately bears with others, for as long as patience is needed. Love doesn't demand others to be like itself, Rather, it's focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to become what others need it to be. Mm -hmm. Love is not overly ambitious or self-centered or consumed with itself that it never thinks of the needs or desires that others have. Right? This is what it means when God says to be agape, to walk in love. This is what it means. To do that could we all go a little deeper yeah yeah could we all get a little bit better yeah mm -hmm. all right let's pray lord i ask you to help me open my heart so that agape can begin to flow from within me you already deposited that love within each and every one of us father god and we open up the, those gates that's holding that love back and we ask you to just flow. I realize that I've allowed myself to get clogged up with my own self-interest for far too long. Help me to focus on the needs of others. Then, on, then all of my needs will be met. I realize that the only way I can become selfless is to yield to the Holy Spirit and I ask you to help me, Father God yield to you in a deeper way. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you today to do whatever it is necessary to teach me to regularly walk in this high level of agape. I ask you, Lord, to help me renew my mind so that I can take on the true definition of agape. And I ask you, Lord, help me Help me with my words. Help me with my actions so they are a manifestation of your agape. And not mine, but your agape. In Jesus' name, amen. And, and I just keep getting in my spirit saying, if you're struggling with this, the Lord says, just ask me. Just ask me every day. This is why the Lord said to do those love confessions. Speak those love confessions because that opens up those, the, that little gate that you have around your heart where God has poured out his love. Because, you know, a lot of times we have a wall with a gate because we don't want to get hurt. Yeah. So we open it up when we want to and we close it when we, when we don't. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, okay, oh, okay, I think I can trust you, so I'm going to open it up a little bit. Oh, no, I don't trust you. We're going to close it. <laughs> exactly. Put a lock on it, you know, chains, all this stuff, you know, barbed wire, you know. <laughs> you know. But God wants to 
But God wants you to cut the chains off, cut the lock off, and open it up. This is where the shield of faith comes into. Don't build a wall, get under the shield of faith. Because see, now you have a better understanding of love. That love isn't something for you to get. It's a principle that when you manifest love, yeah, you're going to get it back, but you might not get it back from who you think you're going to get it back from. Amen. And that's okay. But God is faithful, and he will love you, and he will send people to love you right where you are at. You don't have to do that. You don't have to say, well, I'll just, I'll, I like to give gifts because I like to get them. So that's my motivation. That's not love. That's selfish. Okay? And so now that you have a better sense of what love is, that you can now understand that, okay, I have the power of God's love on the inside of me, and I can do things for people not expecting them to to do it back to me. But I know, I know that if I'm ever in need, if I need, or if I need a manifestation of love that God is going to provide. And it may be that person that I bless, it might not be, but God will provide. Mm -hmm. He will always provide. That's where we need to get to. That's where we need to get to. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, you know what? I just keep getting in my heart. I need to anoint you. If, if you're really struggling with just manifesting the love of God, Lord says to just come up to the altar, and I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to lay hands on people. Don't be ashamed. <laughs> no. There's no time for shame. You know, if you want more manifestation of God's love, and it might, you might not be struggling. You might just be like, you know what? I just need more love. Amen. I just want more love in my life. So, I, Lord, shoot me up some more love. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm drink it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Pour some Fear and worry to go right now in the name of Jesus. I speak agape, agape, agape. There we go. Agape. Agape, agape, agape. There it is. There it is. There it is. Agape.
protection go right now in the name of Jesus, and I just speak agape. Agape, agape, agape. 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 There it is. Agape. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And fear of rejection, I command you to go right now in the name of Jesus. Frustration. Some bitterness and resentment, I command you to go right now in the name of Jesus. And I just speak agape, agape. Agape. Agape love. Fill her up, Lord. Agape. Agape, agape. Thank you, Lord. Agape. 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 There it is. There we go.
frustration or bitterness and resentment. It's like a spirit of rage and temper tantrum, and I go command that to go right now in the name of Jesus. And I just speak love, love, agape, agape. Bitterness, resentment, I command that to go. Fear of rejection and fear, I command that to go right now in the name of Jesus. I can just speak agape, love, agape, love, agape, I'm not good enough. I command that to go. I'm not worthy. I command that to go right now. And I just speak agape, agape, agape. 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 I feel better after that. It looks good. Glory. Agape. Some power <laughs> in that word. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> and see, when you pray, we do a little training too. But I was taking my time because I wanted to, to, to get that flow going. To get that flow going. So some people took a little longer than others. That's all right. You know, sometimes you just got to wait. You just got to be patient. You just wait and just be like, okay, huh, okay, okay, you just gotta just like, all right, Lord, how much, how much do they need, how much do they need, glory, 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 
Um, thank you, Father. Tell me your name again. Naima. Naima, okay. I, I just wanted to make sure I had the pronunciation right. But when I lay hands on you, it was like, it was a different that flow, because normally it was just heat with everybody else, but it was like my hands started tingling, and it wasn't because they were like, <laughs> the blood was coming down. No, it was just like fire. And, and I was just asking the Lord, the Lord says, I'm gonna made, you're gonna major in God's love. And in other words, he's gonna reveal his love to you in a greater measure, and you're gonna do things that's gonna be surprising to you. And how you treat others, how you speak to others, God says he's taking you to another <coughs> level of love in him. So he says, so stop worrying and stop doubting who you are in him. Because he's got you. And he says, and through this revelation, you're going to see a manifestation of his power that you've never seen before. Amen. And, and a lot of things that you've been praying for is coming through love. Amen. He says, so my daughter, so just spend time with me. And let me show you what love is all about. Because there's some things in there that you kind of have wrong thinking about love. And Lord says, I'm going to change all of that. I'm going to renew all of that for you. And Lord says, and you'll be known as a prophetess of love. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Wow, God is good, isn't he? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So I just hear the Lord saying, so stop doubting my children. Each and every one of you is going to see a manifestation of my power through the love that I have given to you. So stop doubting. Stop doubting who you are and what you can do through me. Because I have given you everything that you need. Don't you see? My love has been shed abroad in your heart. And it is through my word that you keep filling yourself up with that love. So come, 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 my child, and spend that time with me. Because I have given you everything that you need in love my love is not weakness my love is strength my love is power so come my child come and give it all to me so that you can manifest love to everyone that you see 